بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأصلي وأسلم على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Last class we stopped at the social effects of zakat and if we were to talk about this freely this would maybe take a whole book because the wisdoms of Allah's commands are endless we can come up with so many benefits if only humanity had eyes to see they would have accepted Islam Islam is the religion that obligates in an individual's wealth a certain percentage with conditions once fulfilled that he or she must give her. and this percentage is not once a year it is throughout your life as long as you ful fulfill the conditions as long as you have a specific threshold that you possess and this is not taxation as some people may claim taxation is imposed by the ruler for the benefit of the ruler or his government or the army while zakat is given primarily and generally for the benefit of the community as stated by the prophet ﷺ to Mu'adh ibn Jabal when he sent him to Yemen he said call these people to Islam and inform their wealthy and given back to the poor so it is for the embetterment of the whole community of the whole society and there are many benefits but the book mentions few and we will just skim through them first of all it talks about the blessing in one's money after giving zakat and the blessing is something that non-muslims cannot understand and even if they understand the meaning do not believe in the essence of it Muslims on the other hand believe that blessing comes only from Allah Azza wa Jal. so they believe that the Quran is a blessing specific surahs of the Quran are blessing such as Al-Baqarah and Al-Imran they believe that Mecca and Medina as far as destinations and locations are a blessing they believe Ramadan is a blessing the night of Qadr is a blessing as in terms of times Friday is a weekly blessing it's the best day that the Sun has ever risen on if you look at the Kaaba at Arafat blessings the food we eat is a blessing that the Prophet tells us do not do not eat from the middle rather eat from the edges because the blessings of Allah descends on the middle and there are so many things in life that we seek Allah's blessings through for the sake of Allah they give it happily with their own consent and the best part of it is that the vast majority of wealth is hidden what is meant by hidden Sheikh there is visible wealth such as livestocks such as grains that are 
coming from earth such as things displayed for commercial use or commercial transactions selling and buying all of these things are visible here it is the responsibility in a Muslim country that the Muslim ruler sends his agents to calculate and collect the zakat and bring it back to the Muslim's treasury, Baytul Mal. But the vast majority of Muslims' wealth is hidden. And this refers to gold, silver, and cash. These are all hidden in our possession. So our bank accounts do not fall under this category. We have to give it ourselves to the poor and the needy. Women's jewelry, as we will talk about this in a while, inshallah, also has to be given by the individual to the poor directly and not through the government and not through the Muslim ruler. So it's not taxation. It is when you feel that you're giving something to the poor directly from your hand to his or her hand. Secondly, when you give zakat, you tend to penetrate this veil of greed, this need of being miser. So you succeed in overcoming your evil desires by giving because a lot of the mus a lot of the people in general at their attes or at their storage rooms you will find things that have been lying there for tens of years okay why don't you throw it do you need it so no i don't need it why don't you throw it i don't know maybe one day i'll need it and you'll find that 80% of the things that we possess in our homes are disposable. We don't need it. And we'll never need it. And we'll never use it. But people don't give away. So it helps to, to cure us from the greed that we have. Also, zakat shows the poor and the needy that we care for them, that we love them that they're not neglected or forgotten. And this is why we go out of our way, looking for them, the real poor and needy, and sharing with them some of what we possess willingly, because Allah ordered us to do this. This spreads an atmos atmosphere of love and care. So after being envious of the rich, the poor now, are making dua for the rich who gave them their zakat money and they're asking Allah to bless their wealth and health so they reciprocate with the rich by such dua and such warm feelings and of course when you give zakat you're not doing it for any other reason than to worship Allah Azza wa Jal which makes you a person expressing his gratitude to Allah through action. So you're actually asking Allah Azza wa Jal for more of his favors and blessings through expressing your gratitude by giving zakat willingly and happily. And of course, it is an article of Iman that you fulfill this pillar of Islam. Among other that do on loans. And this is in so many cases an issue that people are confused about. So people come to me and say, Sheikh, I have borrowed two hundred thousand dollars for my real estate so I'm paying the loan back in installments but the person who lent me 
wants two hundred thousand dollars this is the balance in and in my bank account i have forty thousand dollars so do i have to pay zakat or not people would immediately jump to the conclusion and say no because the balance is hundred and sixty thousand dollars in the minus you have to pay that so there is no zakat on you and this is a person who borrowed money what counts is what i have in my possession for a lunar year whether it's mine or not what do you mean Sheikh? see when i took a loan it's not the actual money with the numbers on it the serial number that is my loan the loan is something that i am held accountable to pay whether from this lot or from another lot or from my bank account or from my, from my offshore account it doesn't matter the amount registered is a debt on myself not on that specific thing that i borrowed and this is different when i borrow your car for example so i borrowed your car i drove it for a week i can't give you something in replacement and say okay i took from you this um, i have no right in doing this i have to return exactly what i took from you so is it the value that i have borrowed from you or is it the estimated amount or cost in two hundred thousand dollars it is the amount and the cost in the issue of the car it is the car itself that i, I borrowed so i have to return that so this means that when i have a loan but i still have assets or money at hand I have to give zakat on that and it's an issue of dispute but the most authentic opinion is what you had heard the prophet والسلام, whenever he sent his agents to collect zakat they would come to an individual and they would count the heads of sheep the heads of cows the heads of camels and they would see the amount of harvest he managed to do for his dates or for his raisins or for his corn or or, or uh, uh, barley or wheat and they would calculate zakat take it and leave they would never ask okay are these sheep yours or you borrowed them which means that when you borrow the zakat on it while it's in your hand so if for example i borrowed two hundred thousand dollars from my friend abdallah and i put it in my bank account and for a whole lunar year i did not use it or i used some of it but it's in my bank account it's in my possession if it were to be destroyed by fire or a thief it's none of my business you borrowed it you return it therefore if it stays with me for a whole lunar year i have to give zakat on that because it's under my possession my control i can do with it whatever i want so going back to the old example abdullah gave me two hundred thousand dollars as a loan and i spent it to build my house but i still have forty thousand cash in my bank account i must give zakat on the forty thousand that i had given that i have kept in my bank account i must give zakat for that now let us reverse and look into the zakat of the loan from the view of the person lending so abdullah comes to me and says sheikh 
I gave $200,000 as a loan to Brother Asim. Zakat or not? Again, this is an issue of dispute. Some say we have to look at the borrower. So we ask Brother Abdullah, the person you had lent the money, if you ask him next year, meaning after one lunar year of possession, and you say, listen, it is time to pay zakat. Can you give me my $100,000 back, please? I don't know if it's 100 or 200. This is one of the advantages of writing down your loans, which is very important. And lots of people don't do it, which is wrong. Even if your brother borrows from you, have two witnesses, or write a piece that given me, was it 100,000, 200,000? Most likely it's 200,000. Anyhow, and writing down a loan is mentioned in the longest ayah in Surah Al-Baqarah, the longest ayah in the Quran. Allah tells us when you deal in lending and borrowing, write it down. Not only that, the Prophet told us that there are three people whom Allah does not answer their dua. One of them is a person who had lent another a sum of money, but he did not write it down, nor had two witnesses to witness the transaction. It is his fault. If he makes dua against that particular person who's not returning the money, Allah will not answer his dua. So going back to Abdullah. Abdullah, the 200,000 you gave to Sheikh Hassan. If you ask Sheikh Hassan when it's time for zakat, can you please give me my 200,000 back? If Sheikh Hassan says, okay, here it is, then you have to give zakat on time. But if the Sheikh says, Wallahi, I don't have money. I apologize, but I'll try my level best to collect it as soon as possible. So he's in, unable. Or the sheikh says, what 200,000? You don't have witnesses. You don't have a paper. <laughs> I'm not going to give you anything. Sue me if you can. So he's not unable. He's not willing. In these two scenarios, scholars say that those who are unable to return or to pay off the loan until they receive the loan back or some of it. So Abdullah, if the Sheikh is unable to return the money this year or the following year or the 10 years to come, and he apologizes because he's broke. He doesn't have the money. Or the sheikh is evil. And he's not willing to return the money because you don't have any proof against him. In both cases, you don't pay the cat. Until you receive your money back or some of it. So let us assume that five years later, the sheikh comes to Abdullah and says, listen, out of the $200,000 or what I could gather is this $20,000. 20, so please bear with me. So he gives him $20,000. Now he returned $20,000 to his possession. He gives 2.5% of this $20,000 for zakat. The five years he pays only once zakat because now he has the money in hand. So I hope this clarifies uh, things a bit now we have zakat on gold and silver we spoke about that um, I don't know why they are writing it again but we said before that the five categories of wealth the first one is gold and silver and the threshold for gold is 85 dollars uh, 85 grams 
and the threshold of silver is 595 grams of silver. This is taken from the hadith of 20 dinars or 200 dirhams, etc. We won't go to uh, details for this as it's a little bit confusing. Just bear in mind if you have 85 grams of gold or more, you should give 2.5% as zakat over the whole thing you possess. So 85 gold of the 100,000, of the 100 grams. What about you have a kilogram? You give 25 grams of the kilogram. And the silver is the same thing. What is it do? What is due on gold and silver? Uh, we went through that. Uh, conditions for zakat obligation to be applied. The conditions for this ritual, for, the, for this form of worship, does not include what other forms of worship require. So here we have only two conditions. One, ownership of the threshold of zakat. So you must have it with you and you're capable of dealing with it as you wish. But if it is an amount of money that you're supposed to inherit from your father, but it is withheld with the government for the past 10 years, there's no zakat on it. Although I have 10 millions that the government's supposed to release every time they're stalling their paperwork, their this and that, people need bribes, there's no zakat on it. Likewise, a lot of the evil mother-in-law women have they come they go to their sister daughter-in-law <clears throat> they take all the gold and cash they possess without their permission and sometimes even without their knowledge and they conceal it they hide it and they don't give it to the daughter-in-law at a wedding or so why is that she says maybe she's gonna run with it so it's not a good business. It's not your husband's gold. It's not your gold. It's the daughter-in-law's gold. You in Islam are considered to be a thief. And you are a thief. You do not fear Allah Azza wa Jal. I doubt if you know Allah to begin with. You have the right to take a possession. She's not obliged to obey you or to listen to you or to do anything for you. Daughter-in-law, my foot. With all due respect. So she has no right at all in doing this. So the daughter-in-law comes and Sheikh, my mother-in-law took my gold, even the one that my father gave to me, my relatives had given to me. I said, Wallahi, if, if I were in your shoes, I would go to the police and file an official complaint because this is evil. But you don't want to destroy your marriage, unfortunately. Therefore, be patient. She says, okay, do I have to pay zakat? The answer is no. You don't have to pay the zakat and she, that is your mother-in-law, will pay heavily on the day of judgment and hellfire for not giving the zakat money because she's the one who made that impossible. So this is number one, worship of the threshold of zakat, that you have to have this, otherwise there's no zakat. If you have 85 grams of gold, there's no zakat. If you have 494 grams of silver, there's no zakat. You have to possess the threshold and you have to have full authority to do with it whatever you wish. Number two, the passing of one lunar year. And that is, of course, with gold and silver, huh? because we know that this is different when it comes to grains and dates, etc. grown from the ground. This is only due when harvesting is due. Now, if you notice that these are the two only conditions which answers the question of a person who happens to have orphans under his guardianship. So Brother Abdullah comes and says, Sheikh, I forgot another question. You know the $200,000 I gave to Sheikh Hassan? Forget about that. 
not forget the Lord died last year and he left a girl and a boy and they're uh, four and seven years of age and he left a lot of money for them so my question is do I have to give zakat or not and I say hmm it's an issue of dispute among scholars the most authentic opinion is that you have to give zakat but sheikh they're orphans and they are below the age of puberty so the form of worship of zakat should not apply he said yes salat does not apply hijab does not apply hajj does not apply fasting does not apply because they have not reached the age of puberty yet but zakat applies because it is Allah's right for the poor in the wealth that you have in your possession or in your guardianship. And this is why Uthman, the third caliph, may Allah be pleased with him, used to advise people such as you, Abdullah, to invest orphans' wealth. And he says, do not leave them for charity to be consumed by zakat. When you only have a hundred thousand dollars and it, it takes like five, six years to the child to grow up and take or, or assume control over his wealth or maybe more. And every year you give 2.5%, $2,500, $2,500. And 10 years this is $25,000 a lot of money so Uthman and many scholars may Allah be pleased with him say that you have to invest so look at an Islamic company that has shares in the stock market and buy shares that are Islamic and let them do the business invest the, give the dividends and at the end of the day the prices are higher than the day you have bought them so you've invested it wisely and in a halal uh, place likewise if a person is the guardianship guardian of a grown-up man who's in his 40s but he's say insane we cannot give him money to buy things we have to have a guardian supervising his wealth and his well-being and Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. The following section is about combining gold and silver. So, Sheikh, I have 70 grams of gold and one kilogram or two kilograms of silver. So, silver, I have value, value of both gold and silver. I would have a lot of money. So, do I have to give zakat on the 70 grams of gold the answers no you don't combine two different species two different items in order to pay zakat for example what is the threshold of camels raise your hand if you know you don't it's five camels what is the threshold of cows 30 and you have to give a tabir. 40, you have to give a musinna. What is the threshold of sheep? It's 40 sheep. You have to give one sheep. So if I have, for example, four camels and 29 cows and 39 sheep, do I combine all of these three and give zakat of one sheep maybe? To consolidate consolidate the answer is no you cannot mix these types together each is required to be handled alone so i hope this clarifies this zakat on jewelry zakat on jewelry so definitely there is no zakat on pearls on emeralds on rubies on diamonds on platinum because we know that the five categories of wealth 
these precious metals or stones are not mentioned in them. So no matter how expensive your gold necklace is or how cheap, what counts is the weight of the gold in it. So if a woman comes and says, Sheikh, I have a diamond necklace that is $100,000 worth. And I say, hmm, any relations to Abdullah? No, Abdullah was 200,000. 100,000 is reoccurring nowadays, nevertheless. So she says, I have this necklace of diamonds. Do I have to pay zakat? Most people said, of course, $100,000, you're crazy. But Islamically, if you ask any scholar, he would say, how much gold is there in this necklace? Or do you have other gold and silver jewelry? She said, no, this is the only thing that I've inherited from my mother. And I cherish it and I love it. I don't have any other jewelry. The sheikh says, okay, how much gold is in it? She said, I don't know, I think maybe five grams or 10 grams. The sheikh says, there is no zakat in it. What? It's $100,000 worth. Yeah, there's no zakat in it. And another girl comes and says, Sheikh, I have these bangles. And they are uh, um, the only thing that I have. Do I have to pay zakat? He said, it's gold. She said, it costs 100 grams times, let's say, $50 a gram. $5,000. Peanuts compared to $100,000 necklace. Yet this has the cat, that doesn't have the cat. So why, Sheikh? Well, this is not logical. No, it is logical. Diamonds are precious stones that have no value. Some you can, sometimes you buy them for 100,000 when you want to sell them. Maybe if you get 5,000, that's good. Because the prices of diamonds plunge. While gold and silver have always been the backbone of economy since the beginning of time. And due to the reason that this is what Allah has ordered us to give zakat on, we cannot come and say, okay, Sheikh, I have a very expensive mobile phone. Do I have to give zakat? I have uh, a very expensive car. A Bugatti, Veyron, or Chiron. Do I have to give zakat on that? Again, it's not from the category that we have mentioned regarding wealth. So, when it comes to women's jewelry, the most authentic opinion is that if it contains gold or silver and it reaches the threshold, the nisab, and you possess it for a whole year, lunar year, you have to give zakat whether you wear them or you keep them in the safe for years it doesn't matter whether you lend them to other women to wear them or you don't the same ruling applies because schools of thought differ some say that if you wear them you don't have to give zakat like your normal clothes like your car that you ride you don't give zakat on that because you use them on daily basis, but this is not authentic. The ahadith where the Prophet ﷺ asked a woman who came with her girl with two bangles in her hand, and he said, do you give the charity, the zakat of this? When the girl said, when the woman said no, and the Prophet said I saw that they not and gave them as charity. This indicates that the girl was wearing it, yet still it is zakatable. And this is the opinion of Sheikh bin Baz and, and Ibn Ithameen and a great deal of scholars of the Salaf. But it is indeed an issue of dispute. And this, this issue of dispute may become helpful when a, when a woman comes and says, Sheikh, for the past 10 years, I haven't been given zakat. I didn't know it was obligatory. Now to say that, okay, you have to give something that is disputed upon would be a bit unfair 
for that woman, losing half of what she possesses, maybe, or a quarter of. In this case, we may say that, okay, if you did not know it was obligatory, we give you the benefit of the doubt, start from this year. So I hope this makes uh, some sense. Now, um, the rest, I think, is on the same topic, so you go through it on your spare time and tell me uh, and ask me if you have any problem with that. Uh, the questions of uh, last session, 12th of March, the first one is from Jainaba. She says, or he says, or they say, is it right to recite Surah Yasin for the dead? Scholars of Hadith said that all a Hadith related to Surah Yasin are not authentic. And one of the strongest of them, yet still not authentic, is read Yasin over the dead. Between brackets, the dying. And this is what some scholars say that, yeah, it is recommended when someone is dying to read Yasin to him because they're that were sent to them. And the story says that he, in the Quran, it says that, Ya layta qawmi ya'lamun. I wish that my people know how Allah has forgiven my sins. Which may give the idea that they have killed him and that he was happy because he was martyred. So this God tidings of this man, uh, being honorable and being blessed by Allah Azza wa after death would make the dying person feel happy, feel a little bit comfortable. But the hadith is not authentic. And definitely it is not at all accepted for people to read Surah Yasin uh, uh, and give it the, or the reward to the deceased. Or they read it at the graveyard, in the graveyard. Or they read it on the seventh or the day of his death or the 14th day or one year after and do do khiwani etc all of these are innovated and not part son who's 20 years and stays in india in chennai which is very hot he had exams and missed six ramadan days so can i feed poor for his missed fast it seems Zinat, that your son simply was lazy and because it was too hot, he skipped fasting Ramadan. So if this is the case, if he did not fast these six days from the very beginning of the day, so it was night time before Adhan of Fajr, he had the intention not to fast. In this case, he cannot make up these days and you cannot feed any poor person for these days. And Allah will never accept it from him, even if he offered uh, a gazillion days in return. Because he had committed a major sin. And Allah has prescribed fasting of Ramadan on specific days. So if you skip that intentionally, Allah will not accept this. But if he fasted like five hours, three hours, and made him eat and drink in this case he's obliged to make up for these missed days and ask Allah for forgiveness and repent to him but again there's no feeding for that Marzia says my wife had two miscarriages we decided that before trying next time we will do a, a, a Umrah now what's happened due to coronavirus outbreak we do not know when we will be able to perform umrah should we start trying for a baby or our intention complete is to do the umrah first no there's no obligation it's up to your preference as long as you did not make a vow to allah by saying that we will not go for such an attempt before making a umrah there's no problem in changing your mind and going for a third trial because no one knows when 
things will go back to normal. We are hopeful that by the end of it would be fixed and inshallah the ban of traveling of Umrah, of Hajj, of visiting uh, the holy shrines would be uplifted. But this is all in Allah's knowledge and ilmul ghaib. So hope for the best. Go for uh, uh, the baby and when you are able to do your Umrah bi'idnillah. Mum Ramlat says, My co-wife is not talking with me. Even if I greet her, she won't answer most times. I tried to make peace with her, but to no avail. Uh, please, what should I do? Well, the Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam, it is not permissible for two who are quarreling, who are fighting, to not speak with you. I fought with you. We fought over something. I felt bad about it. Islam gives me three days to cool down and vent. On the fourth day, if I meet you and I don't greet you, or if you greet me and I don't return the greeting back, I am sinful and I'm committing a sin. And Allah would not look at my good deeds record books every Thursday due to that. And the Prophet said, والسلام, that the banam. So as long as you see her and you say loudly that everyone is able to hear, Assalamu alaikum, and she doesn't reply to you, you should be happy. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will appoint an angel that would say to you, Wa alaikum assalamu wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And Allah is happy with you for initiating. And Allah is angry with her because of her uh, uh, um, not replying and disregarding your salat, uh, your salam. So what should I do? Nothing. Live normally. Ignore her. Don't go out of your way seeking her pleasure. Maybe she has issues. Either way, you did what Allah has told you to do, and that is giving salam. Every time you see her, or you, when you enter a room, you say Assalamu Alaikum and move on. If she doesn't reply, go and do whatever you want to do as if she does not exist. Maheen <clears throat> says, I recite Surah Al Sajda every night, mostly sitting on my bed. I perform Sajda Al Tilawa on while sitting on the bed. Someone told me that Sajda while sitting on earth. My question is, is it permissible to perform sajda on my bed? The answer is yes, providing that the bed itself is as firm as the ground. But if the bed is, the mattress itself is soft, and when you put your forehead and you get or permissible, in addition to the fact that the prostration is not mandatory, so if you read the Sajda uh, Surah and you skip it, there's nothing wrong in that at all. Afia says, Ya Sheikh, if my sister asks me to send the link of a bridal his, uh, hairstyle so that they can hairdo the bride by looking at it, if there is a mixed gathering, will it be sinful for would I be sinful for sending the any collaboration in an evil act will secure a share for you in the sin Allah says in the beginning of Surah Al-Ma'idah chapter 6 cooperate on righteousness and goodness and do not cooperate on evil and vice anything that is sinful so the answer is yes you should not direct them or help them in any way fatima says can you please explain the procedure of paying zakat what should we do after calculating the amount we should pay should we give our whole zakat to the zakat administration 
or can we search the beneficiaries near us our whole zakat of one year to one person or can we share it to many persons fatima i've answered all of these in the previous lessons so it would not be very wise to go through them again you have to go and watch the lessons and then ask kindly uh, uh, your questions so you calculate your zakat and if you have 10 poor people and you give each one of them a hundred uh, uh, each one of them a hundred dollars this is a thousand maybe eight of them would not benefit from it because it doesn't pay their electricity bill it doesn't pay the rent it doesn't pay for medicine it pays part of it so it's best to secure one poor person's needs rather than dividing it on 10 or 100 poor person without securing securing any of a, an individual's uh, needs and another question for fatima if one fainted out of tiredness of fasting would her fast go void or should she continue fasting no if she wakes up her fasting is still intact unless she drinks or eats but if it's, she's too tired and medically she should break her fast to regain her strength rather than keep on suffering and maybe harming herself more in this case no she's obliged to break her fast shama says i know nisab of gold is 85 grams for example i own 22 carat gold of 100 grams should i give zakat for 2.5 percent of the value of the 200 grams or should i pay zakat let, let us see the calculator so we have a hundred grams times 22 carats divided by 24 carats and this is this gives us 91 grams of 24 carat gold so your 100 grams of 22 carat gold actually contains 91 grams. 22 carat gold you have to give 2.5 percent of it which is 2.5 percent of 22 carat of gold if you go and check the value of the 100 grams that you possess and the jeweler's shop told you that it costs x amount of money you multiply that by 2.5 percent and this is your zakat or another easier way to calculate your zakat is to divide whatever you have by 40 and the result is the zakat so if i have forty thousand dollars for a whole year and i'd like to give zakat out i divide it by 40 and the result is a thousand dollars this is my zakat or i multiply it by 2.5 percent and the result will be again one thousand dollars her second question is is zakat calculated on income or savings for one particular particular year no the zakat is calculated on the savings dollars a month it has nothing to do with zakat some people tend to spend the whole amount within 30 days i have a big family i have a lot of children i have my parents i have my nephews and nieces who are orphans and i have to pay for them by the end of the month the ten thousand dollars are all gone do i have to pay zakat no because after one year i have zero in my saving account unlike someone who is being paid one thousand dollars a month and he lives with his family with his wife with his mother and he eats and drinks for free and the car was bought to him by his father so he actually saves nine hundred dollars a month after one year this man would be saving eleven thousand dollars 
give or take. So does he have to pay zakat? The answer is yes. He doesn't have the right to say, yeah, this is unfair. I'm being paid $1,000 and I have to give zakat. And this man is being paid $10,000 and he doesn't have to zakat. No, this does, this deals with the savings. Reaching the threshold and one lunar year passing over that. And Allah Azawajal knows best. Um, Yasmin Khan says, my parents wish to distribute wirtha among their own son and two daughters. I think I've answered this before. Anyhow, they want to sell the properties and give the money in cash. Um, they want to sell the property, but my brother is against that. He wants land, flat, or a farm. Uh, please guide. I, I don't know what to guide. The parents have all the right to sell their properties and give it donation. No one can complain. If the father sells his farm, his flat, his building, and uh, uh, his land, and takes the million dollars and gives it as a gift to his wife, his children can't complain, can't ob even object. It's none of your business. It's my hard-earned money. So I don't know how this son has the audacity to object to his father. If it were halal, I would have told the father, go and just give the money to the girls. Forget the boy. He's not dutiful. He's not respectful. But this is haram, unfortunately. If the father says, okay, this is a million dollars. I'm going to build a, 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 a real estate building and make it waqf endowment to give for the poor and to the needy, to da'wah organizations, to tahfid al-Quran, to Huda TV, etc., no problem. He gives him. He should be grateful for that. And by the way, the daughters and the son in the life of their parents, they should be given equal amount. The son does not get twice the daughter. This is only after the death of the father or the parent in inheritance. But in normal life, no. A gift is a gift. Azra says, if one has loans to be paid in his liable, is he liable to pay zakat? I think we've answered this in the beginning. So please refer back to the uh, the class at the beginning. Madhu says, or Mudu says, Salam, I want to ask whether a Muslim can work in Central Bank, which is government owned. The answer is no. The Central Bank in every country is the regulator of riba is the one who decides the interest rate is the one who obliges all the banks to put their deposits with him and either physically or not physically but he still gives the banks a percentage of on their deposits he regulates riba he uh, does everything that has to deal with riba so definitely working there even as a janitor is not permissible and Allah Azza wa knows the best this is all the time we have and until we meet you inshallah next um let's say Monday Thursday I leave you fi amanillah wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh